everybody. Thank you for joining me here today. I'm really glad to be back at WP campus. Um, today I'm here to tell you the tale of two major website overhauls. One that moved St. Mary's University onto WordPress and another one that rebuilt WordPress into something more sustainable for us. So along the way, you're going to learn about some of the pitfalls we faced, some of the affordable tools we came across that you can use to check your own website. You'll also learn how to smooth things over with those masses so they don't all come to you yelling, you move my cheese as soon as you move it. So just to get a quick feel for people in the room, um, how many of you would say you're developers? Good smattering. How about designers? And it's totally fine if you raise your hand multiple times because I know some of us wear so many hats. Managers? <coughs> Marketers? We've got everybody here today. And do we have anybody who's kind of an all-around webmaster? All right. I'm one of y'all because I do a little bit of everything myself. I've tried to wrap up a little bit of all these different disciplines into this today. So you can all take away something that inspires you to take action. I do want to note that all the quotes that you'll see in the slide deck are from Spencer Johnson's famous book, Who Moved My Cheese? I really find it interesting personally how people can think that moving digital documents is a bad thing because to me, unlike a printed book where the pages are static, a website is really a living, breathing collection of information where things are constantly updated. But I know that many, many of you have been in situations where those changes were not necessarily so well received. So some of you who have been in higher ed for a while have probably seen this diagram before. It's a Venn diagram with things on a university homepage, things the visitors are looking for, and that little narrow spot in the middle where they overlap. Some of the things listed as being on the homepage are a campus photo slideshow, press releases, and a letter from the president. From the things people go to the site for a circle, we have the campus address, application forms, parking information. And in that middle where, the, where both circles overlap, the only thing that shows in both categories is the full name of the school. Internal stakeholders and your website visitors often have very different ideas about what should be on a website and how it should work. And of course, it's not just the homepage. It's every section of your website has a different group of stakeholders with different ideas and probably different levels of technological expertise. Hopefully you're all here because you want your institution's website to focus on that sweet spot in the middle where you're meeting your institution's goals and your visitors' goals too. I'm here to tell you it is possible. You'll probably never have a perfect site. I'm not sure that one even exists, but you can cut through a lot of the clutter and give everyone a better user experience. And you can gather the data you need to prove that you're improving the experience and win people over to your side. One of the biggest keys is to make progressive enhancements. So instead of these major redesigns every five years, you make smaller changes every few months. Another key is to test and measure your changes. So you can really say without a doubt that it's the changes that led to success and not some vague external factor that nobody can really identify. So from the book, the quicker you let go of old cheese, the sooner you find new cheese. In 2011, St. Mary's had what I like to call a proprietary quasi-CMS, which was basically just a PHP file that interpreted query strings to figure out what other PHP files to include, and maybe a little bit from a database. It sort of got the job done, but then one day the web developer, the web developer, up and left. So it became clear to even the non-technical folks that the site needed to move to a more standard platform. So based on the fact that the previous site had been made in PHP, it was neck and neck between Drupal and WordPress, and in the end, it was WordPress that won out. This was a really, really painful transition. Since the old system had no concept of hierarchy whatsoever, just endless query strings, for this first overhaul, the tools were really simple. Paper, red pens, and weeks and months of time. So my office literally printed out a list of every URL on the site and divided that list up into stacks. Each person went through their stack, often having to go to the website and type in the address to see what was on that page. And then they decided what was current, what would stay, and what would go. When they were ready to load content onto the new site, there was no such thing as exporting, 
they manually copied and pasted from the existing website. And they had to do double work making changes on where they could on the old site and the new one until it was ready. There was a vendor that set up WordPress on a fresh new shiny server and they developed a custom theme and installed plugins while the St. Mary's team was loading content. So during this, there were fits and starts of the site crashing in the middle of content loading. But eventually the day came and the new website launched. Now, this was before my time, but I have heard a couple of firsthand accounts of the fallout and it really wasn't pretty. I'm hoping that some of you have campus communities that embrace change, but in our case, the faculty and staff at that time really did not embrace this change. As our next quote from the book says, the more important your cheese is to you, the more you want to hold on to it. Now, because communications had done the hard work of trimming the fat, they didn't let everyone on campus back in as a content editor. You see, this wasn't just a migration to a new platform. It was also the beginnings of a workflow so that we could keep the site more current and the branding and writing styles could be more consistent. So as you can imagine, when these stakeholders whose cheese had just been moved, realized they couldn't move it back again, they didn't respond with thank you notes and congratulations. Hmm. <laughs> of course, you could debate the pros and cons of having more content editors. On the one hand, allowing people to make their own updates makes it easier for them. So if you have engaged faculty and staff members, it can bring you fresher content. But on the other hand, Allowing people direct access to make all their own updates without moderation makes for a lot of content that comes from different voices. And if you have editors who try to tightly control formatting by adding things like lots of inline styles, it can make the aesthetics pretty inconsistent, not to mention the whole other topic of accessibility. When you have content editors who are in the system every day, it's really easy for them to forget little things like adding alt text and uploading web friendly images. <clears throat> Some of these issues are really a lot easier to solve than others. So, for example, we use the Msanity plugin, which resizes every upload automatically. So, if they're uploading their CMYK 4000 pixel wide image, it's not a problem. It automatically fixes it in the background for them. And there are also plugins to check for basic accessibility standards, like just making sure you have alt text on everything. But there's still no substitute for someone who's experienced with WCAG standards manually reviewing the page to make sure it's up to par. So since communications and this vendor were in charge of the migration, we gained control of our information architecture. It took some time to smooth things over, but eventually most people learned to appreciate the changes or at least live with them. Some stakeholders, however, have learned that if you push hard enough for long enough, you can eventually wear down some of the resistance and get your own way. So over time, several things happened. One school broke off and built their own separate website, except that in order to give certain offices just one website to log into to make changes, about 20% or so of that school's content stayed over on the institutional website. So visitors had to click back and forth, back and forth from site to site. Admissions then liked that microsite idea, so they built their own. And since the focus of the main institutional website was on admission, a lot of content got duplicated there. Meanwhile, Google Analytics was set up, but it was just quietly collecting data in the background because no one really knew much about it. Another school pushed hard enough for long enough that instead of just having one list of their academic programs, they got two, one by department, which they were certain everybody would be looking for, and one under a list of all the school's programs. Plot twist, hardly anyone used either of those paths. Most visitors came straight from the university's list of all the programs, not really caring what school or department a program was in. So over time, content was published in two or even three different places, all to make sure someone could navigate to it using a specific linear path that somebody on campus really preferred. So it wasn't quite the clean, fresh start that everyone had envisioned. So fast forward to the part of the story where I come into the picture. It's 2015, three years after WordPress has launched. There's already been a complete redesign and a number of enhancements. They've added various custom post types, cron jobs, taxonomies, you name it. 
Up until now, St. Mary's has been using the vendor who did the initial migration. So for hosting, updates, enhancements, everything. And they've found that just core and plugin updates take up almost all the monthly retainer hours. So they decided to go back to an in-house position. I've just come in to fill that position. And after browsing through the website from the outside and giving some initial recommendations, like making sure core is current, removing the second slider plugin, things like that, I think we're in pretty good shape. As soon as I'm given access into WP Admin, my mind is blown with the amount of custom post types and pages and content. The cheese is not as fresh as I thought it was. So I slowly dig through each post type, about a third of which are not actually being used. They were just developed for a proof of concept, and they're sitting on the live site because there's no website, there's no staging, there's just prod. One of the CPTs is built just to spit out HTML to paste into MailChimp, yet it's still accessible through permalinks and sitemaps, so it's competing with our original news posts. There are thousands of URLs for what really should just be hundreds of pieces of content. So I start to map out the actual hierarchy of what's used, what's not, and what's been duplicated and triplicated. Even more fun, they've set up that individual school on its own site mostly like the institutional website, but not quite. So its theme, even though it's named the same, is about 10% different. Just enough to make me have to comb through its code separately. As I spoke with the vendor and poked my way deeper into this code base, I learned some scary new things. Like the site had been loading too slowly, so the vendor had created a custom table to hold a copy of page navigation and they use that instead of WP list pages. So those of you who raise your hands as developers, I hope you're either cringing or just not quite processing what I just said because it makes no sense. Later on, I found out they've been using a combination of plugins that stuffed the options table so full that the little database server was too overloaded to even perform WP list pages which also caused some really fun downtime not long after I arrived. So it took a fair amount of time to slowly trim out the old things that weren't used and the weird things that shouldn't have been used. I felt a little like a contractor who has come into this monstrous building that looks clean and simple on the outside, but inside the electrical wiring is about to catch fire. The plumbing is lead and it's routed so oddly, you really don't know what you're gonna have to tear up to figure out where it goes and there are 17 different colors of paint on the wall. You just have to roll up your sleeves and start using some elbow grease on whatever looks like it might pose the most imminent danger and ignore the moss green shag carpet until you're sure the house isn't gonna collapse around you. So I had to remind myself as the book says, see what you're doing wrong, laugh at it, change and do better. A few months in, we left the vendor and their hosting behind, and I'll give an unsolicited shout out to Pagely for helping us migrate everything, including our really weird, complicated cronjons and settings that a lot of hosts might have overlooked. So now that the inside of the house, the code behind was somewhat cleaner, it was time to work on the user experience. <laughs> So having heard how well the changes went over last time, I started to arm myself with the data. It's easy to demand a navigation structure you like, but it's harder to defend it if it doesn't work when the numbers prove it. So once I mapped out all the content and checked our analytics for basic page views, I found out 37% of our pages were getting less than one visit every five months, including those people on campus who were demanding this navigation structure and the pages that we had in place. So now that the site wasn't crashing at random intervals, and we knew a lot of our content was gathering dust, it seemed like the next logical steps were to trim the content and the navigation. Again, because of the previous negative response to major changes, my team decided it would be safest to trim down navigation before we actually moved any pages. So in preparation, I consolidated our Google Analytics pages and added some filters to better handle the multiple subdomains that were feeding into the one account. And I set up Crazy Egg on our most popular pages. Now Crazy Egg tracks pages one by one, but we wanted to track navigational clicks site-wide. So I set up a little JavaScript, which added a class and a unique ID to all the header and footer links. Every time one of those links was clicked or tapped, 
a PHP script inserted click data into a custom data, a custom table. We recorded what page the person was on when they clicked, which specific link they clicked or tapped, the link text so it was a little more human readable, and their IP address so we could tell whether they were on campus or off. Nowadays with the GDPR, we would just set a flag of on or off campus so we wouldn't be collecting that. This screenshot on the slide is something I manually put together to more visually display the data since Crazy Egg only shows a screenshot of what's already visible on the page, not things like the drop down navigation or site wide elements. And it ended up being worth every minute I had to spend pasting and nudging these little bubbles around because it was so easy for everybody to understand exactly what each little number meant. So as I suspected, a lot of these links were not used or very seldom used, and this was not over summer or Christmas break, it was prime time. So based on this information, we reduced the number of links in the header and footer from over 200 to under 80. This was going to have a major impact on user experience and SEO, all without actually moving the cheese. Most people on campus actually didn't even notice, but the few who mentioned it, mostly to ask for their link to be restored, we're able to live with the change for two reasons. One was we had the data to show them only a small percentage of on-campus visitors were even using it particularly. The other reason people accepted the change was we explained our plans for the future. This was not the final navigation, no news, nothing higher, but this was an interim step. IT was just on the brink of launching a new intranet, which would make it possible to gather all of our internal documents on one site letting the institutional site hone in on just prospective students and public audiences. We also had a plan to conduct a lot more usability tests and continuing monitoring analytics to help guide our decisions. So with all the new data, we would be better able to bring the most sought after content to the surface and make these stakeholders most important pages easier to find. Who would want that? Another major change I made early on was to fix site search. Anybody who has used WordPress built-in search knows it's lacking, and anyone who has a big institutional website or multiple sites that just can't be searched because they're separated knows how painful this topic can be. If you have a single WordPress site or multi-site, and that's all you need to search, there are plugins available like Relevancy, but in higher ed where every department in every school and office has a separate budget, and a different platform on a different subdomain. It just wasn't going to be possible to use a WordPress plugin to solve this problem. So after searching for a while, I found a company called SwiftType that solved the problem. They have a crawler that will index as many domains and subdomains as you want with whatever restrictions you want. So obviously we wanted the institutional website and the rogue school fully indexed. But then we had sites like Athletics where we only needed the home page. So the game results didn't overwhelm people searching on our main site. And then there were the other sites like the academic catalog where we wanted a few key pages indexed, but not the whole thing because visitors typically want to see a program page and not just the boring catalog description. The other big benefit with SwiftType is you can customize your search results. They have this drag and drop dashboard so you can set up specific pages as the top results for certain queries. You can also set up synonyms, so things like dorms and residence halls will still bring up the same results. There are just tons of customizations you can do. They'll also send you weekly reports on your top keywords, as well as keywords that have no results, so you can continually be improving your results. That was the first major website change that only received compliments, so I felt like we set a good precedent there. So by 2016, the header and footer had been tamed. Old unused post types had been weeded out. The theme had been recoded. You could actually search the website and find things. And we had a solid post to prevent embarrassing downtime. The critical cleanup was done. So what next? My goal was to improve both the SEO and the user experience. So I went back to the data. I researched how people were navigating to each major section of the website. Often there were two or three different ways that were all being used. And often these paths were not the very linear drill down paths that we had created, like going to a school, then a department, then the level, then the program. A lot of times people would drill down from academics to programs, to a specific program, or even start off browsing an event and then search for a program that related to something that resonated with them. 
So it wasn't a case of content being in a wrong place. Different visitors just navigate differently and that's okay. The problem was our structures were all silos. So knowing that our hierarchy was hurting us, we secured budget dollars to set out on our second big overhaul, rebuilding WordPress from the ground up. It was time to completely replace the theme and all the post types so we could tackle the actual content cleanup that we'd sidestepped when we just updated the header and footer. We found a new vendor and zoomed out to a 10,000 foot view of the site, not just at that point in time, but where we wanted it to go in the next five to 10 years. And during the course of several multi-day planning sessions, we mapped out the different types of content we had and what we might want to build in the foreseeable future. Since we also knew the intranet was launching soon, we took that into account and we were able to really work toward our vision of making this main institutional site primarily focused on prospects and their parents with just enough additional information to take care of the rest of the general public. We scoured analytics to find out how our visitors were connecting the dots. That was a crucial step, looking through our site search logs to see what people were not finding in the navigation, as well as what pages people tended to view after looking at a certain page. This all helped us understand the thought process of the people we most want to use our website, the prospective students. It helped that we had Google Analytics views set up specifically for on and off campus traffic so we could focus specifically on the external visitor's behavior. We knew that nesting pages under pages under pages and maintaining two or three copies of these pages under different paths was what was hurting us. So instead of thinking of every page as only reachable through its tree, we had a light bulb moment when we realized we needed to map out the relationships between our content. So for one example, we determined we needed a faculty post type that can be assigned to a department of post type, which is assigned to a school taxonomy. And the relationships could then automatically build those navigational pathways we needed without having to create copies of anything. The new theme template for a department would automatically list out any faculty and programs associated with that department. So we would no longer have content editors manually managing these links. The templates would always take care of it for us, keeping the site fresher with less effort. It was the same with our other new post types and taxonomies. Everything was very carefully crafted to give us the structure we had needed from the beginning and take advantage of automation. So we had our plan for new content types, but there was still this labyrinth of content that didn't quite fit into clear buckets. There were still pages that had not been seen in months or even years. How do you go about cleaning up that mess? Well, this time we did not use stacks of printouts and red pens. I was determined to sort the pages digitally in some way that would let our whole communications team help with the work. So I tried out several different sitemap services, but none of them ended up being quite right for us mostly because our hierarchy was just so sprawling, it's hard to capture on a single screen. So I did something unusual. I combined Google Sheets, card sorting, and balsamic. And I'll walk you through what we did one step at a time. First, I pasted every single URL of our websites, the institutional site and the room school into Google Sheets. I then spent what felt like an eternity adding analytics for each page so we could judge what to keep and what to trim, not only by opinion, but by numbers. It took about a week to pull all this data and double check it for accuracy. I played around with the API, which will allow you to pull it automatically, but because we were just dealing with so many different pages, we maxed out the number of possible API calls and it just didn't work smoothly. So I stuck with the manual process to make sure we got data for every single page. Then it was a matter of going through line by line to decide what could move to the new internet, what could be completely removed, and what could be combined. So here's our spreadsheet showing each page title, its analytics, and the old URL. And I believe this was about six months worth of unique page views in that number column. Another column that didn't quite fit into the screenshot here showed the new URL where it was going to live. And we also tracked all the printed vanity URLs we knew about so our spreadsheet came to over 1,700 lines, which I know is small for some of you, but it was huge for us. So we kept some of our key URL structures, but in the end we went from over 1,200 pages plus our news articles on the main site down to 450 plus news. So there were a lot of redirects to set up. 
The only way to make sure we didn't miss any was to track everything. So that was what the Google Sheets managed us to do, and it allowed our whole team to go in and edit together. Now, a giant spreadsheet like that is enough to make anyone go cross-eyed, let alone someone who thinks visually like me and you designers here in the room. So I went back to my UX toolkit. Card sorting is a way to rethink categories and structures. If you haven't heard of it, it's basically a process that asks different people to group information whatever way it makes sense to them. You can do it with post-it notes, but with that many pages, I think we would have had to take over the whole arena. So I found a free card sorting program and we did an open sort where we started with our lower level pages and let people group them into buckets. We named the buckets later and those then became our top level and second level navigation. The other option you have with card sorting is a closed sort where you already know your top level categories and you just have people group the cards into them in whatever way feels logical to them. Going back to the wisdom of who moved my cheese, he knew sometimes some fear can be good. When you're afraid things are going to get worse if you don't do something, it can prompt you into action. But it is not good when you're so afraid that it keeps you from doing anything. So as you can imagine, sorting 1,200 pages into buckets was a pretty long and painstaking process, and we went through several iterations. But in the end, just like a jigsaw puzzle, things started to fall into place, and eventually we ended up with a manageable number of groups. Then I took the, back, the groups back to the team, and we chose labels for them together, and we made sure that overall we were not missing any major buckets. The goal at this stage was not to make sure everything was perfectly categorized, but just to identify top level and second level categories, everything basically that would eventually go into our top navigation. So now we had this giant spreadsheet to track all the things, and we had all of the content loosely sorted into buckets. And next up, we needed a way to visualize the sitemap. Not long before we started on this project, I had set up a new website for our alumni so I still had access to a Balsamic membership, which had worked great for wireframing. It suddenly occurred to me that I could use their little text boxes and arrows to build a nice, simple sitemap. You could also do this in Visio or Illustrator, and in hindsight, one of those might have been a little easier just because you can control page sizes, and we have a few people in our office who really need that hard copy to review anything. But Balsamic's workspace expands just as big as you need to be. There's no limit on your artboard size. So I wasn't constrained, which was might work so much better for me in the end than any of the site mapping tools I had looked into. And snapping the arrows to points and alignment tools helped my slightly OCD personality make sure everything was spaced out evenly and snapped to the right points. So I started with those buckets we had identified in card sorting and then went one by one through the spreadsheet, checking each page to see how much content it had, then adding a new square to Balsamic each time it looked like we needed a new page. Every square contained the new page title and all the different spreadsheet lines where content was coming from. So all those little numbers are different lines in the spreadsheets, with the original pages where they were gonna be combined from. Many of these combined content that had previously been spread across four or five separate pages and again, a lot of this was not about linear hierarchy. It was just grouping and adding the right relationships. Once I had a rough draft, I printed it out on 11 by 17 pages and met with our team to review and adjust. And we iterated until we felt we'd arrived at the best structure. I should mention this was not a completely linear process from step one, step two to step three. For the hierarchy project, we did sit down first and review analytics and predictions to determine the overall content types and relationships. That way our vendor was able to start building out those custom post types, taxonomies, all the relationships while we sorted through the content. Some of the content structures were more straightforward. So for example, we knew we were going to still have a campus life section. So some of that type of known content we loaded earlier into the new site than some of the other pages where we weren't quite sure yet where in the structure they would land. So although this may sound like a clear logical progression in hindsight, in reality it was a little bit messier and we still faced the same problem as the first migration. We couldn't really export the old site and just import it because the structure was so very different. And we had about a month's worth of time when everyone had to enter the changes into both the old live site and the new staging site. But with the visual sitemap to guide us and the spreadsheet to track all the content so we wouldn't lose anything in the transition, 
we at least knew what percentage of the content had been loaded and therefore roughly how much time was left before we could switch over to the new site. While we were wrestling with the content, the vendor was mocking up various theme templates to make sure that our fresh new site would also get a facelift. When you're changing your entire information architecture, there's really no progressive enhancement or A-B testing little changes where you can send people to two different versions and determine a winner. So to measure the success of this project, we looked more to the page views and the time on page for the content that we most needed our visitors to look at, like the list of all of our academic programs and the main admissions page. And while the vendor mocked up pages, we did some usability testing to make sure visitors' perceptions of the new designs were positive. These tests, which we did through trymyui.com, gave us some really good insights and told us that the designs were right on track, but there were a few tweaks that would make the overall experience a lot better. We made a number of those tweaks before we ever launched. Our whole office pitched in to copy and paste from the various source pages into the new staging site, and then previewed it to make sure that the finished pages made sense visually and not just on that big old spreadsheet. Anybody here can build a tool that can magically crunch all these numbers and build the new site. I'm sure I can find budget for it somewhere. But if comparing the data before the restructure and after, it's a night and day difference. And even on a shoestring budget, you really can make an impact if you're willing to put in the elbow grease and track the results. So here are some of the things we learned from these two big overhauls. Lesson number one, make smaller changes whenever possible. Focus on one section of your website or something site-wide like button styling so that instead of waking up to a whole new website, stakeholders can see small changes happening over time. Lesson number two, collect as much data as you can to support your changes. Do usability testing, do A-B testing, even pull relevant Google Analytics, anything that helps justify the reasoning behind the changes you're making. Lesson three, keep your stakeholders in the loop. They won't wanna hear about every tiny change, but some of the folks like your admissions team and deans are gonna to wanna to know if you change the layout of all the pages about majors and graduate degrees. Give them a little summary, maybe a preview on a staging site before the change goes live. And again, give them some background and data to back up your choices. Lesson four is offer options. Whenever certain stakeholders are losing power, give them a concrete plan so they don't feel like you're completely cutting them out of the loop. In our second overhaul, everyone who was not in our communications office lost editing permissions on the main website. That was hard to swallow for some folks who have frequent updates. The key there was to think through the process. So we already had a new request form built when we talked to those offices. That way, they were reassured we would get their updates posted in a timely manner. We'd actually thought through how this would impact them and how we could make things better. In a couple of cases, the offices ended up happier because we can actually make updates a lot faster than they can. And that's one less thing to, on their to-do list. And when it's not a case of power loss, but maybe you're simplifying and losing some functionality, offer options. So instead of just telling people, this is the new way we're rolling with it, Bring them in halfway through the process and explain why their preferred ways are not working. Help them see the bigger pros and cons and make suggestions of their own so they're helping you decide how to move forward and meet all your goals together. Last but not least, I want to leave you with a couple more tools to make cheese moving less painful. I can't recommend A-B testing highly enough for those smaller changes. Anything where you're not overhauling your whole information architecture, which should be a very rare occurrence. We've used a number of testing tools over the past few years, and the two that have worked best for us are Visual Website Optimizer and Google Optimize. Visual Website Optimizer is exactly what its name says. You set up an A-B test where you'll have a control group and at least one variation. So for example, one of our tests was to change the above the fold content on our main about page to see if we could funnel people to our most important pages faster. Half of our website visitors saw the old about page with lots and lots of paragraphs, and half of them saw the new version, which split out some of our key differentiators in a little list and added some little images as well. VWO let us set this test up by just adding a line of JavaScript to the one page. 
And then we used their WYSIWYG editor to create the new second layout, so I didn't have to touch the site-wide styles or anything like that. The new version blew the old one away, with visitors spending more time on the page and clicking through the new links to our top pages. So we were able to test this change and confirm that it was these content changes, rather than any outside factors, that contributed to visitors staying longer to consume more content and going straight to our top converting pages. Google Optimize is really similar, though I've found you have to get pretty creative with the measurements there. One test we ran that was really successful was when we changed our site-wide fonts this spring. We were tired of the all-caps heading font we had loved during the hierarchy project, and we wanted to see how different fonts would affect engagement. So we initially picked eight fonts that coordinated with our printed collateral. I set up our staging site so the about page could render each font based on a query string, so everyone in our office could see exactly what they were going to look like with real content. From there, we narrowed down the list to the three that we liked the most. To make this test work site-wide, I had to load all of those fonts plus our old fonts in the head of the site, and I added a line of CSS as well, so that if the body had a specific class, it forced all the fonts to render in one of these new variations. Then in Google Optimize, I created the four variations, the original plus the three new fonts, and I just added that body class and the variations to make the different fonts appear all across the whole website. It was a little hard figuring out what variable to measure as the goal since Google Optimize's goals are fairly primitive compared to some of the paid options. But I ended up hypothesizing that if people found it easier to read the website, they should stay on our website longer and perhaps explore a little more. So I set page views as the goal. I was really surprised at the huge difference the fonts made. Our control with our original fonts averaged 2.7 pages per session. One of our test fonts matched that almost exactly. Another test font raised it to 2.85 pages per session, and the winner raised the bar to 2.9 pages per session, which is a 7% increase in the average number of pages people look at before they leave our site. Keeping people on the site just by changing the fonts was a huge win. So I hope I've got you thinking about some experiments you want to try and ways to help your stakeholders become more comfortable when their cheese gets moved. One last reminder here, if you have questions, we're doing them, I think, mostly in Slack. Or is the website accepting? The podcast them? channel is open, and um, for those of you here, you can ask out loud or post stuff in the Discuss channel in Slack. Don't forget to submit feedback. Does anybody have questions in the room? What was the name of the A-B tester other than Google Optimize? It didn't catch it. Visual Website Optimizer. It goes by VWO for short. Thanks. It's a great back. service. It's fairly affordable. If you can't go back and do it again, is there anything you do differently? <sighs> The question from the yeah. yeah. So the question is, if we had to do anything to any, if we had to do it again, would we do things differently? I know for the first one, they definitely would have tried to find a, a new PHP expert to actually export content instead of doing the manual parsing. For the the main hierarchy project, I think the biggest thing I would change would have been to have two different environments that we could work in so that the vendor could have been working in a dev environment and we could be loading and staging without all those fluctuations of the site suddenly breaking as they were pushing code. That's about all I would change on that project. What do you use for an intranet? For an intranet, we ended up using, oh gosh, what it, I think it's an Elucian product, I want to say. I will have to get back to you on Slack with that. What's next? Right now we are working on redesigning just the home page because we still have that same static home page we've had since the hierarchy project in 2016 and we want to kind of feed it more dynamically. So our news posts and different things that change automatically without somebody having to make changes all the time and our events will be higher up. So smaller projects like that are the focus now. So with your redesign, like how big uh, was your team and your budget? 
how big was the team and budget for the redesign. We ended up with a $25,000 budget for our vendor, which I think was pretty fair to them. And our team, um, I'm the only developer, SEO, analytics, kind of a mastery person on the team. But on our communications team, we have anywhere from about 12 to 15 different kind of content editors in the system. So that's the size of our team. All right. And if anybody has anything else, you can come ask Aline. Otherwise, uh, I think it's lunchtime. So, yes, um, enjoy. Thank you.